Well, what's up, church? Hey, today we continue our spiritual disciplines collection, and I'm super excited about it. This whole year in 2023, our theme is salt and light. Jesus has called us as his followers, as the church of Jesus Christ, to be salt and light in the earth, to be change agents, to make a difference. And so all year long, we're talking about that. Today, uh, we're in week three of our first collection within that theme, which is spiritual disciplines. Come on, if we're going to be disciples of Christ, then we have to be disciplined in following him. Uh, A disciple is someone who's disciplined. A disciple of Jesus is somebody who's disciplined in the ways of Jesus. And so we don't want to be a church. We don't want to be Christians that are a a product of society. We want to be, um, we want society to be a product of the church. Come on, somebody say or type amen. We want the world around us to be different because we're in it. And for that to happen, we have to be spiritually resilient. We have to be spiritually strong. We have to have discipline in our lives. That's what a disciple is. We have to have discipline in our lives where we are grounded, we are rooted, we are strong, we are firm and mature in the faith. And that's a journey that we're all on for our entire lives on this side of heaven. Uh, as a church, though, this year, we're taking eight weeks and we're, we're looking at eight disciplines of a Christian that will strengthen us and to form us and to mature us so that we can be the people that God's called us to be. And uh, if, you've, if you've been with us, this is a journey. If you haven't been with us, maybe today's your first time watching or your first time watching in a while. Uh, and so you're kind of jumping in. You can go back and watch. Pastor Tony kicked off the first two weeks for us. You can go back and watch the first two disciplines. Week one, we talked about the practice of his presence, how to comprehend and be aware of and understand and interact with the presence of God on a daily basis and honestly from a moment to moment basis. So often we think of God's presence as something that's at church or something that's in a prayer meeting and and we're in it and then we're out of it. But the presence of God is in us. The presence of God is around us. The presence of God is something that we can interact with and recognize, acknowledge day in and day out, moment to moment. And as Pastor Jude says, even the moments between the moments in our coming and our going as we're driving, as we're washing dishes, as we're doing chores, as we are at work, as we're walking from one meeting to another, recognizing the presence of God. If we want to be disciples, we need to be able to do that. Week two, last week, we talked about the practice of divine reading, reading the word of God. We talked about lectio and meditatio and oratio and contemplatio, those four Latin words, uh, the four ways of reading. Um, It's not just speed reading. It's not just checking off a box, but it is reading slowly, consuming like a great meal, the word of God, meditating on the word of God, repeating it out loud, talking it, letting it be on our lips, Um, speaking that word of God out loud in the form of prayer, praying the word of God over our lives, um, back to God, and then contemplating the word of God, contemplating what does this mean for me? What are the the implications uh, in my life According to what I'm reading today, that's contemplating the word and then making a decision to put it into practice. So last week we talked about the practice of divine reading. And today we're going to talk about the practice of divine guidance. Divine guidance, a very interesting topic, one that you might not hear preached very often, but so important in our lives. It's the, it's the practice of being divinely guided by the Holy Spirit of God. You know, we are referred to in the Bible as sheep. We, we are um, alluded to by Jesus and in other places, sheep. So sheep, you need to know that sheep don't lead themselves. Sheep have a shepherd. Sheep have to be led. Sheep aren't that smart. And so we are alluded to at compared to sheep. You need to know that you're being led today. You're being led by something, by someone. You're being led by your feelings. You're being led by the world around you. You're being led by... God, or you're being led by the enemy, or you're being led by other people. You are being led, though, because we are sheep. And today we're going to talk about the practice as Christians of being led by God. There's so many things in our lives, so many decisions we need to make, so many pathways we could go. There's there's a plethora, there's an overload, there is a massive amount of information in our lives, of decisions that we have to make every day. We make thousands and thousands of decisions every single day. 
And as Christians, we just don't want to do it haphazardly. We don't want to do it based on our own feelings. We don't want to be led by what culture says or what society says or what, what temptation tries to get us to do. We want to be led by the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen? And so we're going to talk about divine guidance, being divinely guided by God. Before I read you a few scriptures on this, I, it is my first time preaching here online in a couple of weeks, and I thought, you know what, I have this bad habit of doing dad jokes in my message, and so I've been struggling with, do I continue those in 2023, and I just got to let you know that I can't help it. What do you call 10 rabbits in a line walking backwards? Does anybody know? It's called a receding hairline. Um, we're going to get to the scripture. I do have one more. I have one more. I don't know if you heard about it, but around um, our area here, there have been these thieves that are stealing the wheels off police cars. Did you hear about that? They're working tirelessly to try to, to, try to catch them. All right, we're going to get into the scripture. Here we go. Proverbs eleven fourteen. 14. It's talking about guidance and how we need to be guided. Um, Proverbs eleven 14. Let's, let's run through a, a few passages really quick to set the tone for today. For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advisors. I, 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 I don't know if you notice what is going on in our nation and in culture and the world around us, but when there's a departure from the guidance of God, when there's a departure from Scripture, when it comes to our moral compass and our true north, when, when a society, when a people, when a family, when a church departs from the ways of God, it comes to ruin. For a lack of guidance, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advisors. Leviticus 19.31, do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Saying don't turn to any other influence. Don't turn to obviously demonic influences, ways of the world, wicked wickedness. In our day and age, this can look like turning to pop culture, turning to what society is saying, even a lot of higher education right now. It's, it's leading us down wicked paths. And so it's saying, don't turn to other things apart from God. God says, for I am the Lord, your God. And this is what happens. In First Chronicles, we get uh, an example. It says, Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord and even consulted a medium for guidance. He's consulting somebody other than God for guidance. He did not obey. He was unfaithful. He didn't keep the word of the Lord. I don't want this to be us. I don't want this to be definitely our families in our church. I don't want this to be our community. I don't want this to be our nation. We want to we want to be guided by God. Watch this. Isaiah 30, 21 says, whether you turn to the right or the left, your ears will hear a voice. This is going to be big for us today as we get into this message behind you saying this is the way walk in it. Isaiah is saying you're going to you're going to be at points of decision and you're going to hear a voice. The voice is obviously the voice of God. And that voice is going to be giving us guidance. And watch this, Isaiah 58. It says, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. He will guide you Always. We read in Psalm 1 that we read in Psalm 1 that those who keep the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night, will be like trees planted by the riverbank, bearing fruit in season. When we are guided by the Lord, we get the blessing of the Lord. But when we do it the world's way, when we turn to other things and other people for guidance, for our decisions, knowing what's right, the end is destruction. So if we want the blessing of God, we have to be guided by God, the practice of divine guidance. Last scripture to open us up today, John 14, 26, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit. Come on, aren't you thankful today that we have the Holy Spirit of God living, active inside of us, all around us because of what Jesus did on the cross. We have access to the presence of God, our advocate, our helper, and our friend, whom the Father will send in my name, Jesus says, and he'll teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said. Come on, the Holy Spirit of God reminds us. The Holy Spirit of God keeps on the forefront of our minds and our hearts his teaching, everything that we've learned, everything that we know. The Holy Spirit is there. As Isaiah would prophesy, like a voice behind us saying, do this, 
do that. Don't go there. Don't say that. This is how you think. This is how you respond. If we're going to be salt and light, we need to, to understand how to be divinely guided. We need to be disciplined in being divinely guided by the voice of God. But here's the problem. We live in a world where it is so easy to be distracted. And you already know this. You know that we live in the most distracting time that we've ever lived in. For sure. Why? Because of our devices. I've got, I've got two devices. I've got my phone with some notes on it. I've got an iPad with some notes on it. I'm setting my iPad on my phone. I mean, we, are, we have technology upon technology. As I said, information upon information. And, and it's not bad. It, it's not bad in and of itself. But even a good thing can become a bad thing when it distracts us from God things. You like that? Well, a good thing can become a bad thing when it distracts us from God things. We live in a very distracted world. Um, Pastor Tony was saying that, that device time, screen time, is at seven hours and four minutes a day right now in our society. Seven hours. We are looking at a screen. Maybe that's some for work. Maybe some of that is for productive things. But nevertheless, we're looking at a screen for seven hours hours a day and then we heard one hour and 39 minutes though a day is media on our phone so this is mostly obviously social media um, whether it is you know instagram facebook TikTok, whatever it is that we are consuming media on our phones one hour and 39 minutes a day it got worse during the pandemic children 12 to 13 saw screen time double double what they did in 2019 in 2020. And the effects of that post-pandemic have remained. We are distracted. We are addicted to phones. We are addicted to social media. How many times do you take out your phone and naturally, just before, without even thinking about it, you click whatever it is that you go to. You click Instagram. You click Facebook. You check your notifications. You check what's going on. You scroll through a, you scroll through a feed. It's, it's so addicting. It is so a part of our routine. It's so a part of our lives that we're so distracted. And the thing is about being distracted is we miss when we're distracted what God is saying with his still small voice. When we're distracted, we miss the tug, the pull, the guidance, the, the nudge by God. I don't know if, if you've ever been in the doctor's office with your kids, or maybe you remember being a kid. And one of the things that the strategies that the doctor will use when they're doing something that might be painful to the child, you know, like giving them a shot or doing, doing something that's going to hurt, whether it's ripping off a piece of gauze or Band-Aid or something, th th what they always do is they distract the child and then they do distract the child and then give them the shot. My son was at the dentist and what they do, they said, all right, here we go. We're going to give you this little shot in your gum. It's going to be a little sting in one, boom, and they hit it before they got to three. They're trying to distract them. And then because it's less noticeable when they're being distracted. I threw my back out recently. It's really embarrassing. Threw my back out. I was reaching down to pick up a basketball off of the ground. I wasn't lifting weights. I wasn't doing anything heroic. I was picking up a basketball off the ground. Threw my back out. Anyway, that's not the point of the story today. Uh, I, I, I had major back pain. Here's what happens though when I, when I hurt my back. And unfortunately, it happens from time to time. I'm way too young for this to be happening. But when I hurt my back, a lot of times if I'll get going during the day, doing things, moving around, getting, you know, getting things done, having my mind off of it, my back doesn't hurt. Here's when my back hurts. My back hurts when I stop and I lay down. I lay down at night. I'm like, man, I need to take some Advil. I need to take some Tylenol because I stopped and laid down. And now that I'm not distracted, I notice the pain. I notice the, the discomfort. On a more serious note, if you've dealt with anxiety, um, a lot of times they'll say during the day, people who struggle with anxiety and depression during the day, when you're at work, when you're doing your, your, your chore, when you're doing your random things, you're, you're going, I keep saying chores, when you go throughout your day and you're running errands and you're, you're at work and you're doing things, you're not really anxious, but then, you know, it's when you get home, you start to slow down. They say anxiety is worse in the night and early in the morning. Why? Because you're still, you're alone with your thoughts. There's something about distraction that keeps us from hearing our own thoughts. That might not be as a big of a deal, but here's where it becomes a big deal is when distraction keeps us from hearing 
the thoughts of God. When we're so busy and we're so rushed that we don't hear the voice and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We need the guidance of God more than ever, church. We need direction from God. What do we do? How can we be salt and light? How can I make a difference in this situation? How can I show the love of God? I was talking to somebody the other day saying, how can I, how can I talk about God in a way that's going to make sense in the context of this situation because the factors are weird and I don't want to say the wrong thing and I don't want to lose my, my, my voice with this person or my influence with this person, but they need help. And hey, we need the guidance of the Holy Spirit in those situations. We need the guidance. We need divine guidance more than ever, church but we're distracted more than ever. So over these next few minutes, I want to talk about how in a world of distraction can we slow down and receive from God divine guidance. I'm going to give you five steps. I want to, I'm not going to put them on the screen all at the same time, but I want to tell you them up front. All right, I'm going to give all five of these to you up front. Five steps to receiving divine guidance from God. Five things that you can do practically in your life today starting today, to be more guided from God than ever. Here's, here are the five, and then we're going to go through them and, and with some scripture. First is stillness. Second is waiting. Third is hearing. Fourth is knowing. And fifth is doing. If we want to do what God's called us to do, Jesus would say, after telling us he wants us to be salt and light, he would say, let your good deeds shine for all to see so they'll glorify your Father in heaven. The result of all of this is that we do good deeds, that we do what God is calling us to do. The fifth one is doing, but to do we have to know, and to know we have to hear, and to hear we have to wait on God, and to wait on God. We've got to be still. The first one that I want to put up here is stillness. The lost art of stillness in a world that is so busy. The lost, and I'm not talking about just physically being still, although that would do you good. I'm talking about stillness of the soul. About stilling our spirit, quieting our spirit. Did you know that you can be still while you're going about your day? You can be still. I want to just make sure that you understand that that this should affect the way that we think of our quiet time, our morning time. Um, the, the scripture says, I awaken before the dawn. There, there is an element of getting still before God, getting up earlier than everybody else, beating the hustle and the bustle of life. There is an element of that we should absolutely be convicted by and evaluate our daily rhythm. And if we're getting still before God, but I'm also wanting to make you realize today that stillness is not just physical, but it's spiritual. You can be still as you're walking from one meeting to another and you're, you're going, you're walking down the hallway and you you put your AirPods in and you have a worship song on and you just say, God, I want to be still. What are you saying to me today? What do you have for me right now? I'm going to quiet my soul for these next two minutes. I'm going to be still before you. I'm not going to think about the next thing. I'm not going to think about a former thing. I'm going to be present in the moment. And in secular society, it would be called mindfulness. Um, That's another thing Pastor Tony mentioned is the the mindfulness. There's an industry, literally the mindfulness industry that now that we are aware of, even in the secular world, apart from God, mindfulness, being present in the moment. You know, you you go to a yoga class. I haven't gone to a yoga class, but you walk by a yoga class. They're talking about be present in the moment. (laughs) You know, be be present in this time. And, And it's not even godly. It's just be present with your thoughts right now. We're talking about with God, though, now. Let's still ourselves. I'm not thinking about yesterday. I'm not thinking about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worry of its own. I'm going to be still in this moment with God. Stillness. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. The fourth thing that we're going to get to in a moment is knowing, but you can't know unless you're still. Because you can't hear from God unless you wait, and you can't wait unless you're still. So I'm still and I wait. And then I hear, and then I know. But you got to be still to know. If we don't still our souls, then we're not going to know that He is God. If we're anxious about tomorrow, 
if we're fearful about the future, we need to still our souls. And, and sometimes that's the last thing that you want to do because you don't want to be alone with your thoughts, but sometimes it's the very thing that you need so that you can let the thoughts of God overtake the worrisome thoughts from your own soul. Amen, everybody. The second thing is waiting. Be still and know. Stillness is the first. The second is waiting. I will wait. Isaiah 40, 31. Yet those who wait on the Lord, those who wait for the Lord, those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. Those who wait, those who wait, those who wait. Man, waiting is a lost art in our Christian culture waiting on God because because we in this society we don't wait for we don't want to wait for anything it, there we can pay not to wait my family was just on a vacation and there was and and there was a literally a package where you could pay money not to wait it was a it was a, a package where it was literally you pay money to skip lines you pay money to get to the front of the line you pay money for priority access at guest services you pay money so that you don't wait. And I told my kids that we didn't buy that package because I wanted them to learn the discipline of waiting. Doesn't that sound so noble? Really, it was because I didn't want to pay for that package. Y'all know what I'm saying. But it was a win-win because we're going to learn to wait. Patience is a virtue. I, I need to learn to wait on the Lord. When the Bible says we need to wait on the Lord, yet we have a culture that we want to do anything except wait. You don't have commercials anymore. You, you can fast, for, even live TV, you, you, can, you can pause it, you can record it, you can come back later so that you can fast forward. We don't, we don't like waiting. But waiting on the Lord is what it's going to take in order for your strength to be renewed, and we're going to expand on Isaiah 40 at the end of the message here in a moment where we see that when we don't wait, we actually lose strength. People who are zapped of strength today and are tired and are weary, we don't need to run to the next thing and the next quick fix. The, the very thing that we need is actually in the waiting for the Lord so that He can renew, give us new strength. My next wave and infusion of strength from God is found in my next season of waiting. We must be still and we must wait. And as we're still before God and as we wait on God, waiting for a word from God, waiting for a nudge from His Holy Spirit, waiting for guidance from him. If I'm trying to make a decision, and I, I don't know whether to take that job or to pass on that job. Uh, that job is going to cause me different hours, maybe a different location. Maybe it's going to affect my life. Maybe it is, it's more pay, but it's going to be bigger sacrifice. Maybe it's less pay, but it's going to give me a better quality of life. How do I know what to choose? We must get still and we must wait on the Lord, so that we can hear what the Lord is trying to say. I think a lot of times God is speaking and we are not hearing, but it's not because he's not speaking. It's because we haven't taken a moment to be still. And then wait, because I believe and I think it's proven in Scripture that a lot of times God makes us wait so that we will tarry with him, as, to use an old school word, so that we will wait on him and dwell in his presence because that's what God's after at the end of the day anyways he's after our heart presence with him time with him relationship is what he's after and if we only go to God because we have a need and we need God to fix it now and then it's off to the next thing then we don't have a relationship with God we have a transactional relationship with God where I go to him when I need something I get it and I move on to the next thing let's let's have let's have the the discipline let's be disciplined Learn the practice of being still, waiting, and then being able to hear what he says. Because listen, Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. If we're going to have faith, we've got to be able to hear. But to hear, we have to wait. And to wait, we have to be still. And once we hear, we know. We'll go to the next word, knowing. Stillness, waiting, hearing, and knowing. The Apostle Paul would say in the same chapter of Romans where it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, he would say in the same chapter a few verses earlier, he would say, how can they know unless they have heard? How can they know if they haven't heard? In other words, you can't know something unless you hear something. 
You can't know about God unless you've heard about God. But you can't hear unless you wait on God. Unless you're still before God so that you can hear Him. And, and so I can't know it unless I've heard it. I can't hear it unless I wait. I can't wait until I get still. Isaiah 40, 21 says, do you, watch this, do you not know? Have you not heard? Do, you don't know because you haven't heard. Have you, do you not know this already? Have you not heard this already? He says, has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Isaiah is painting a picture saying this is the word of God's being declared even from creation. God's word is all around us. God's will is all around us. I tell people, you can say this less and less because nobody listens to the radio anymore, but the old analogy, the old metaphor of God is like a radio tower sending his signal, but we've got to be tuned into it. I know it's cheesy, but he's speaking at all times. He's, he's moving us at all times. Isaiah said earlier, we looked at it, his voices guiding us, telling us to go left or right. But if we're not tuned in, then we don't hear. And if we don't hear, how are we going to know? So to know, we have to hear. To hear, we have to wait. To wait, we have to be still. Be still and know that I am God. And the fifth thing is doing. We We'll do it once we know it. We, we, we've got to know it to be able to do it. What do, I, do I take the job? Do I not take the job? Do I pass up on that? Do I, how do I raise my kids? What do I do in this situation with my kids? What do I do with my son who's dealing with this situation? Do I intervene? Do I let him learn? Do I, do I, do I rescue him in, in this situation from from pain or do I let him feel the pain to learn? Come on, somebody. We're in decisions all the time. How do, I don't know what to do unless I've heard and I can't hear unless I wait. I can't wait unless I've been still. But once I am still and I wait on the Lord and I hear and then I know his will, then it leads to doing for they may do good deeds. Let, let the world see your good deeds so they will glorify your father in heaven. Our lives are meant to bring God glory. And once we know, then we can do. Faith comes by hearing. We hear and then we know. Hebrews 11.1. 1. We're going to look at some of these examples. And then I want to go to our closing passage for the day. Closing uh, uh, or some examples in Hebrews 11.1-30. 1 but I'm, I'm going to skip through these really quickly. It says, now faith is the substance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. This is when we put action to what we know. For it is by for, for by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. They developed a good reputation. They developed a good testimony, credibility, because they lived by faith. They did what they knew, and they knew because they heard God. And we see these examples over and over in the Old Testament. And in Hebrews 11, we get the, what's known now as the Hall of Faith. Not the Hall of Fame, the Hall of Faith. These people are people who heard God, and then they did what God said. These people were divinely guided by God, and there are stories all throughout. Most of these are in Genesis, but there are stories all throughout Scripture where these people, you can read how they heard God. They were still before God. They had discipline in their life, and they heard the voice of God in their lives, and then they did it, and it lands them in, in, a, in Hebrews 11, which is showing the testimony of these people. And so some of these examples are here. It's by faith that Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through it, being dead, he, he being dead still speaks. Next one. By faith, Noah. This is by faith that Noah did this. Being divinely warned. He was divinely guided, we could say, of things not yet seen. He moved with godly fear, prepared an ark, for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Noah couldn't build the ark unless he heard what God said. And God gave him direction. God gave him guidance. And then he did what God said, and it's brought glory to God. In verse 8, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go. He was divinely guided by God to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful 
who had promised. She knew and she had faith because she heard God. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Abraham heard God tell him to offer Isaac and he did it. Cohen, these are people that are being divinely guided by God. They are hearing the voice of God. They're doing it and it's bringing glory to God. That's what we want. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he looked to the reward. Come on, there are times when our decision is going to actually bring us more pain. Our decision will bring us affliction. But that's why we have to listen to God rather than flesh. Because if Abraham was, if Moses was listening to his flesh rather than God, he's not going to want to go through the affliction of Egypt. He's, but he's listening to the voice of of God. And when we listen to the voice of God, it can be affliction, it can be pain, it can be hardship. But even if that comes my way, I'm going to do what God says because it's God's way that's going to bring me a prospering and blessed life. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. And by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. Days. These are the things we can do in faith. These are examples of people who did what God said because they knew what God's will was, because they heard the voice of God, because they waited on the Lord. They were still before God. We see this over and over and over in Scripture. And I, as a believer, I, as the leader of this church, want our church to have the discipline, the practice of receiving divine guidance, but to to live by faith, to do these things we have to know, to know we have to hear, to hear we have to wait, and to wait we have to be still. My closing passage is going to be Isaiah chapter 40. We've read a couple of excerpts from Isaiah 40, but I'm going to read a a chunk of this passage to close the message today, and the context is this, the previous 39 chapters of Isaiah um, certainly have moments of comfort and hope But there was a a strong tone throughout these first 39 chapters of judgment um, and warning for the people of God. Um, Where Isaiah 39 ends, Isaiah, on behalf of God, is announcing the coming Babylonian um, conquest of Jerusalem, the exile of the nation. This is not a a good time. Uh, in, in, In the In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 39 is not a good time. Babylonians are coming. They're going to exile Jerusalem. They're going to take people into captive. This was going to be a bitter blow for Jerusalem. And there's no celebration going on. There's no comfort in this time. This is a bad time um, in Isaiah 39. This is the judgment of God, the condemnation of God for disobedience. And, And they know that this time is coming. But then Isaiah 40 comes. And in Isaiah 40, there's a message to the people of God. I want us to take this message that Isaiah is giving his people as a message to us today within this passage this 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 word from God through Isaiah to the people of God within this I believe are words from God that are active in season and prophetic for us today and has to do with us being divinely guided in a season and in a time in our society where things look dark and wicked there are all kinds of reasons to lose hope but if we will tune ourselves and our souls to God, be still before him and wait for him and hear his voice, then we can know what he wants us to do in this time. We can do it and we can be the salt and light in this earth that Jesus wants us to be. It says this, it starts with some rhetorical questions about the greatness of God. So even though this time is coming, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and measured the heavens with a span and calculated the dust of the earth with a measure and weighed the mountains in a balance, in the hills, in a pair of scales. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord? Or as His counselor has informed Him. I love that. Who has informed God? Who has been a counselor to God? The answer is no one. With whom did He consult? And who gave Him understanding? Was that you? No, I don't think so. And who taught Him the path of justice and taught Him knowledge? Was that you? I don't think so. Was that me? I don't think so. And informed Him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its animals enough 
for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. Isaiah is saying in the midst of your problems and despair and conflict, remember the greatness of our God. To whom then will you liken God? To whom can you compare God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? He goes on to say, do you not know? And have you not heard? I pray that we get still before God today and remember how big and how good He is so that we can hear Him and know. Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is He who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretch is out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to live in. It is he who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they been planted. Scarcely have they been sown. Scarcely has their stock taken root in the earth, but he merely blows on them and they wither and the storm carries them away like stubble. To whom then will you compare me that I would be his equal, says the Holy One. Raise your eyes on high and see who has created these stars to, the, to one who brings out their multitude by number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. Why do you say, Jacob, and you assert Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God? Why do you say that? Why do you ask God these things? Do you not know? Here it is again. Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is unsearchable. Somebody needs to hear this today in your life. He is big. He is good. He is faithful. He's not tired. He's not confused on what he wants to do with your life or where he wants to take you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. For he gives strength to the weary and to the one who lacks might he increase his power. Though youths grow weary and tired. And vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. I don't know who I'm talking to today in particular. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what situations that you're facing, but if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and your life is surrendered to Him, my encouragement, my exhortation to you is to be still. Take time in the morning. Take time before you go to bed. Get off your phone. Be still. Wait on God. Hear what the Holy Spirit is telling you so that you can know which way He wants you to go and do what He wants you to do. If you have a big decision about a job, if you have a big life change in front of you or recently behind you, a move, retirement, location change, if you have kids and you need wisdom on how to raise them and what to do, if you have a health decision in front of you, what treatment route to go, what doctor to see, what, what method to use. If you uh, need help dealing with an elderly parent, if you're in a situation where you're making decisions on behalf of a loved one, big decisions, big obstacles in your life, big challenges, let's tap into the practice of being still and hearing, waiting, knowing so that we can do what he wants us to do. I'm going to pray for us today. I, I, I implore you, I encourage you to, to work this practice of being divinely guided into your life. But even today for a moment, I want us to be still before God and hear His voice and what He wants to speak to us through this message today. And I pray that the Holy Spirit has been doing that. But that's what I'm going to pray for as we close. Would you pray with me? God, we are still before You. We quiet our soul before we move on to the next thing. After hearing this message, we... We calm our soul. We put aside distraction. We block out the noise. And we wait for a word from you. Before we make the decision, before we go to the next step, before we step into 
this new season, before we go into our next work day, before we go into our next school day, we quiet ourselves and we wait and we listen with spiritual ears for the voice of the Lord. And we know, we discover who you are and what you want to do for us and in us. And then we make the decision to do it and to live it out. We want to be people. We want to be disciples, disciplined people, God, that shine your light and bring glory to your name as you said, Jesus. Doing good deeds, salt and light in the earth. But to do that, we need to be guided by you. Holy Spirit, guide us. Holy Spirit, be with us. Strengthen those that are weary today. Give them new strength and energy and perspective and wisdom and, and guidance in their lives for in these next days and these weeks and these months and these years to come. We want to be led by you, God. Do it, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen.